Gretchen Ziegler was born and raised in Topeka, Kansas, and grew up planning to be a zookeeper working with big cats. She volunteered as an Eagle Explorer Scout in high school and in, at her hometown zoo, and went to Kansas State University where she got a BS, BS in biology and experience as a ch children's zookeeper at the zoo in Manhattan, Kansas. After graduation, she worked at the Topeka Zoo for six years, gaining experience not only with big cats, but hoof stock. I presume that's horses, cattle. Okay. Anything with hooves. <laughs> Anything with hooves. Birds, reptiles, elephants, and great apes. She spent two years working with carnivores at the Wildlife Safari in Winston, Oregon, until being hired as head zookeeper here in, at Sequoia Bar Zoo in 1995. She eventually was promoted to zoo director. Her hobbies include native plant gardening, hiking, and observing wildlife, which she obviously gets a lot of opportunity to do. Gretchen, welcome. We're happy to have you back and hear all about the changes in the air. <laughs> well, thank you, Jane, for that intro. And thanks, everybody, for coming to the uh, <clears throat> Zoom Ollie Brown Bag. Um, this is my first one. And uh, uh, hopefully it goes well. I think we're all good to go. Um, sorry we can't be in. That's, that's a bummer not to see everybody uh, in the room and uh, doing Q&A. But I think we'll, we'll go ahead and take um, questions anyone can throw out there. Or um, I think Kim is monitoring the chat, right? So don't hesitate to, to jump in with, with questions or do a little chat question as we go. Um, so yeah, I have, uh, I've been at the zoo for quite some time and I've been uh, lucky enough to have gotten to see a, a lot of really positive changes since I've been there. And some of you probably have heard a lot about that. I've done these presentations for the Brown Bag um, series as well as other, um, other uh, talks, service club talks, and we even do a, an Ollie class on the history of the zoo. Um, and that's a really fun one. We really dive into all the changes and why they happened and, and uh, when and, and all that jazz. So, um, so I won't be going into a lot of the history of the zoo, just a tiny little bit as we go. And it's weird, <clears throat> I'm sure everybody is still there, but it's so quiet now that everybody can hear me, right? Good. Okay. I can see nodding heads. All right. So I guess will... we can. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, this must be like what it, what it's like for talk show um, hosts to, to be doing their show without an audience. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, all right. So back to the zoo and um, what it's about. Um, if you've heard this all many times before, I apologize. But sometimes uh, I think people know all of this stuff and then I'm surprised to, to understand that, um, that a lot of people don't. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of uh, what the zoo is all about. Um, so we are owned and operated by the city of Eureka and it's, uh, it's it's been, uh, that's been true since the zoo's inception. Uh, we were founded in 1907, so we've been around for well over 100 years, which is um, pretty amazing. And that's why we've had such a really cool um, kind of slow and steady progression and evolution over the years. Um, we partner with the Sequoia Park Zoo Foundation, which is our um, 501c3 uh, support organization. And they have been fabulous partners with the city of Eureka on behalf of Sequoia Park Zoo since 2004. And uh, we've together accomplished a, a lot of, of wonderful projects, uh, which most of you are probably familiar with. Um, so we are the oldest zoo in California, and we love to kind of say that it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a claim to fame, even though it sounds unlikely, uh, and, and the stories behind that are really fun. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of that today, but, um, but there's, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that little old Eureka has oldest zoo. There was a zoo in, in San Francisco called the Flychecker Zoo, and uh, that's not in the same place anymore, and it's not named the same thing. So um, because of that technicality, we, we are the oldest zoo. 
in California. And again, this is just a, a photo, one photo of many that we have in the archives of what the zoo used to look like. And, you know, it was, um, it was typical of, of all zoos back in the day where you had um, bar cages um, and uh, a lot of concrete and uh, not much in the way of naturalistic habitats. And that's really turned on its head uh, in the last two to four decades, uh, really around the world. You just don't see, you shouldn't see exhibits like this anymore. Certainly not with accredited zoos, which uh, Sequoia Park Zoo is an accredited zoo. We've been accredited since 1995, and we're actually in the midst of accreditation, and I didn't really include any of that in here, um, but I'll just speak to that uh, here for a second. Um, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums uh, accredits about, um, I think it's up to about 240 zoos and aquariums throughout the world. Um, it's mostly in North America, but there's a few. There's one in Hong Kong. And um, these are the these are the top zoos in the country. Um, there are other facilities that are not accredited. There are that are also fine facilities. Uh, a great example of that would be Turtle Bay and in, in Reading. Um, they just have obstacles uh, that won't allow them to be accredited. It's not because their standard of care isn't good, but um, for instance, you have to have a perimeter fence that's secure and their land, they've got so much land at Turtle Bay that they, it wouldn't be feasible to do that. So those are some of the examples of, um, well, I mean, the, the, the application to, to become, to apply for accreditation, which you have to do every five years, um, takes about three months to do, just um, steadily chipping away at all the policies and procedures and documentation that goes into accreditation. And then what happens is your application is reviewed by a panel of about 20, I think, commissioners uh, who are zoos and uh, or who are directors and, and veterinarians at other accredited zoos. And then you're supposed to have a, you're supposed to work like busy beavers and bees trying to get the zoo to look as best as it absolutely can. So every five years, the zoo uh, looks, <laughs> looks about as perfect as it can. And so this last June, we were supposed to have an accreditation inspection uh, where two or three commissioners come in and, uh, and look at us through a microscope. That was canceled, um, thanks to you know what, uh, you know, we got a, a call in, um, April, uh, I think early April saying, guess what, we're not going to be able to do inspections. And this is the first time ever since uh, accreditation was a thing back in the 70s where uh, the cycle was interrupted. So all zoos got a reprieve of a year um, in their in their whole process. And so for us, that means that next June, hopefully we'll be able to have inspectors come and do the inspection. And so our, our five-year cycle will be one year off um, from here out. So, and they're not even sure if, um, if they'll be able to do it then, you know, it kind of depends on, on how the pandemic plays out by then. But uh, so we, I mean, it was a relief to have a reprieve because you never feel like you're ready or you have enough time to get ready. Um, but now it's still ahead of us and instead of behind us. So, um, so it's kind of good and bad, but, uh, but I think it was a good call on their part. So, um, so we're in the middle of our accreditation cycle um, and we have uh, since, you know, 1995 and even before that, we've just made a lot of changes to the zoo. Doesn't look like the old days anymore. Um, I think the oldest part of the zoo now is, um, is the hay barn it used to be called the elk barn and it's sitting right in the middle of the zoo and you don't hardly notice it it's a really low profile uh barn but that's where the elk used to to take shelter so um a little bit of, of remnant history there so um, the mission of the zoo is that we inspire conservation of the natural world by instilling wonder respect and passion for wildlife. Um, the photo that I usually put uh, for this slide of our mission is usually a little kid just bonding um, with a red panda through the glass, but I thought that 
this was a neat photo and it's a little bit indicative of our times. Um, that is Nate Cricken, our uh, fabulous zookeeper who works with the birds and uh, other, other critters at the zoo. And he's got Elvis, our African gray parrot on his hand. And he's talking to people about why pets or why parrots don't make really good pets. Um, and uh, this is a, oops, sorry. Uh, that was a, a former breeding pet bird um, who was rescued out of that situation situation and is now able to free fly around the, the aviary and uh, is, is enjoying herself pretty well. She's fun. If you hear a cat meowing and you're walking through the aviary, it's, it's her. She has a great uh, cat meow mimic and it, it's uncanny, but that's what parrots do. So our master plan is up before you here. It's hard to see, I know, it always is. There's too much detail and, and it kind of gets fuzzy if you try to zoom in on it. But um, I think I'm gonna try to zoom in on one part. Um, this has been a master plan that we've, uh, we've had around since 2006, but it's gone through a lot of updates. And uh, that's because every time we complete a project, um, it's not exactly the way the old master plan uh, drew it. And so we try to update it so that it's accurate, not only for people to kind of orient themselves, but to also help the next project because um, these projects are kind of, um, adjacent to one another as we kind of move through our master plan. Uh, and we started with, um, well, we started a long time ago, but the latest uh, completed project is the wa Watershed Heroes. And that's right inside the, the entrance of the zoo. It, it's this whole area here. And it's, it's part of a bigger zone or a theme called Native Predators, which is this little um, chunk of the zoo right here. So a big portion of the zoo's footprint will be dedicated to uh, native animals and, and predators, the story of predators. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so Watershed Heroes was completed, you know, with the money that we had at the time. And now we're working on two new projects, uh, the Skywalk and the, um, oops, that's not labeled the right name. That's funny, I'll have to tell you about that. And then this will be the, the bear and coyote exhibit, um, all, all of this footprint here. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. You're also, uh, you might notice that there's an interpretive center building right here. And we are in the preliminary, um, concept design phase for a really cool project that's going to anchor all of this stuff in the most amazing way. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but meanwhile, you've got, um, you've got some South American exhibits here. That's not really been developed. We've got the flamingos and the peccaries, but eventually we'll have more species there uh, and it'll, um, it'll all kind of be tied together nicely. Here's the barnyard. Um, that's our domestic area. Uh, and then right here's the, the Asian forest, which is, will be anchored by the red pandas. They're the first exhibit we've got there. We've got a lot of room here for, for um, more exhibits like Clouded Leopard and Binturong for that. And then on the north side of the zoo, these are some of the oldest exhibits that we've got. Um, the Spider Monkey and Gibbon exhibits and the old Bear Grotto, which is now housing the, the bush dogs. That will all be transformed to uh, island adaptation. We'll, we'll have gibbons there and lemurs and um, and things like that. The gibbons will come back. Uh, we no longer have gibbons in our in our uh, collection right now. Um, a super sad, bittersweet, and joyous story uh, that was. And I, I don't have that in here either, but if anyone wants more information about that, just chime in. So that's what our master plan looks like. Um, so on to the, the, the really uh, interesting part of the talk and why many of you probably have joined in today is updating you on the Redwood Skywalk. Um, so we've got some photos here. If you follow us on Facebook or if you're a member and you get our eChat or newsletter that's now coming out once a week, um, you will have seen these photos and more. We've got videos and uh, a lot of, of excellent documentation about this project underway um, uh, than you'll see here. So I encourage you to, to, uh, to look there for some more information. Um, this is just a couple of, of scenes this summer uh, as we've 
been under construction for this project. So we've been talking about the, the canopy walk, which is what our working title was, um, since the master plan came out in 2006. So um, for, for many years, um, this has been our dream and knowing that um, it's, a, it's a really important piece for not only the sustainability of the zoo, but for uh, ecotourism and uh, economic uh, development for the city of Eureka and the region. We have done feasibility studies that that have told us that yes, this is a, a feasible idea and in conjunction with a lot of other uh, tourism type um, activities that the city in particular has been planning or has has pulled off um, that this could really be a, a, a major factor in in the uh, um, economic development of, of the region um, and s given that um, kind of obvious uh, idea, we were able to secure funding uh, very generously from the Lodging Alliance locally. Um, so the Arcata, the Eureka, and the Humboldt Lodging Alliances, all of those groups have contributed most of the funding. There's quite, there's quite a bit of grant funding too for this Skywalk project, but um, the Lodging Alliances recognize that this is a very important tourism driving project that will put heads in their beds. That's how they um, have the funding to, to develop projects like this is that they uh, have a, a self-imposed tax that um, then goes into projects that they, the hoteliers and uh, lodging owners in the region can choose. And so Redwood Skywalk was at the top of their list. And so uh, again, they've been partnering with us for about a year and a half to pull this project together. Um, it, uh, it is not an easy project. Um, and as you can imagine, there, there were uh, a lot of little details going into it to even figure out how much it would cost and what the scope would be. Uh, but it's all fully designed now and we started construction in June. Unfortunately, uh, the pandemic delayed us a bit. So we were supposed to open in June or July. That was our goal about a year and a half ago. And now we won't, uh, we're not looking at an opening date until uh, the beginning of November, which is pretty unfortunate um, for the time of year and the season uh, and visitorship. But again, given the pandemic, um, it might actually <laughs> work out in our favor or um, in everybody's favor that we're not going to be a big grand opening splash um, to get a lot of people through our gates. So we're still trying to problem solve that. But um, this view on the left um, are, is a family looking at some information that we've got up about the project. And then just behind that is what used to be the Yak Paddock. Um, and it now uh, is a construction zone. And um, the animal portion of, of that space is, has gotten smaller uh, and further to the south. And uh, you'll be starting the Redwood Skywalk experience up at the top of the hill, the only hill in the zoo, which is um, overlooking that, that paddock. And there's, it's kind of anchored by three kind of juvenile redwood trees um, that provide a beautiful gateway to this uh, Skywalk experience. And so right where the people are standing on the uh, right hand side of your screen is where you'll start that experience. Um, and it's, it's more developed than this now, even this was taken about a month ago. So, um, so about the Skywalk project, um, we have, uh, again, we've got a great team assembled to, to, to pull this off. And from the get go, our main goal was to, you know, celebrate and get people engaged with the um, incredible uniqueness of our Redwood. Uh, I knew that would happen. I stop that. <laughs> um, sorry about that interruption. Um, to to get people engaged with what's going on, especially in the in the upper parts of, of a redwood forest, um, and also to ensure the 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 health of this forest. We don't want to celebrate it to death or love it to death. Um, but actually that's what's happening at in Sequoia Park. That is a beloved city park. Um, it's been heavily used and and more so every year by people who just um, love it. 
and it's really impaired. Um, and we've we've assembled a team of of arborists and arboriculturists who uh, are either redwood experts or tree experts in general who have. Um, done some extensive studying and, and analysis of Sequoia Park and have identified trees that are um, not healthy, have identified other trees that are. Um, they've identified trees that are suitable to attach to. Um, they've weighed in on the whole issue of whether or not we should attach to the redwood trees versus um, erecting freestanding steel towers. Uh, long, long ago in this whole design process, we, we landed on that the best thing for the trees themselves and the forest itself is to attach directly to the redwood trees. Um, and that, that protects the root zone uh, down below. And the root zone is actually one of the, the things that's most impaired about Sequoia Park because it's so heavily trafficked by foot, uh, a little bit by, by automobile and truck as well. But um, there's a lot of volunteer trails or rogue trails um, that just get you from point A to point B in the quickest route possible. And it's often down a steep slope. You've all seen that out there. Um, and that really creates a lot of uh, root damage and uh, erosion of soil. It goes right into that, <clears throat> excuse me, that waterway, which is the uh, headwaters of Martin Slough. Uh, and Martin Slough, if you're familiar with that, there's a project that, that has occurred down uh, in Martin Slough before you get to Elk River um, that is enhancing coho rearing habitat. And, uh, and it's a really important component of, of the uh, salmonid biology and, and uh, uh, recovery here uh, on the North Coast. And uh, the last thing you wanna do is, is create a lot of erosion uh, in that waterway. And so, one of the goals for this project was to to have a net uh, positive impact on the forest and we're hoping that you know by ha encouraging people to come to the zoo and take this experience up above uh, that it might even eliminate some of that foot traffic down below but in the meantime we have taken care to um, to try and do our best to eliminate some of those really damaging trails this is an example of one to the right um, so so a couple of things that happened at the beginning of the project back in probably it was more like May, June, um, was to create uh, wildlife habitat. And so there were several, uh, I'd say a dozen or so um, trees in the forest at this project site that were hazard trees or considered hazard trees. And again, these, are, these were analyzed by uh, arboriculturists who, who know their business well. Um, almost all of them are white fir, and that's a white fir there that is now becoming a snag. So these, there were living firs that were starting to approach the end of their life span. They don't live, obviously, as long as redwoods by any means. And as they get older and weaker, they tend to fall over. And a lot of the damage that we've had in the park and in the zoo has been from a windstorm that has toppled these white firs. And so we've, over the decades, have been taking them out strategically so that we don't um, have a, a catastrophe. Um, and so we certainly didn't want a catastrophe once the Redwood Skywalk was in. So we had a tree service come out and, um, you know, at first we thought, well, we've got to take them out at the base. And then we realized that, you know what, um, trees, tree, uh, dead trees are, are critically important habitat for all kinds of wildlife. So why don't we instead, based on some uh, advice from these arborists, um, create wildlife trees. And so that's what this guy at the top of the snag is doing. He took the living top off of this white fur. And again, there were um, a dozen or so that we did this work with. And then he, he pieced it out. Um, that's, that's a long way up. We brought it down to about um, 40 feet, 40 to 60 feet above the ground. Uh, and then you can't really see what he's doing there, but he uh, he sliced uh, into the top of the of the stump in a way that would encourage rot, so that it can eventually create cavities and uh, encourage insects and other you know thing wildlife that that use dead trees. Um, and one of the things that um, 
is very detrimental to our forest animals is the lack of, of dead trees standing. Um, dead trees on the ground are important too, but the ones up in the air are, are vitally important. So we've now created some snags. They're not gonna come back. They're not like redwoods where if you top them, they're just gonna sprout elsewhere. Um, they'll die and they won't fall over. And that's another thing I learned is that if you eliminate the, the heavy top, uh, that can catch the wind and take it over, this tree, even if we had left it that tall, um, is very unlikely to fall over and damage things. So um, we also put little slits in there for bat habitat. Um, and so we're really excited that we might uh, have, have encouraged some wildlife um, to come back and use the forest. Uh, and then on the floor, um, this, the, what's it called, slag and, and uh, pieces of the top of the tree that you see on the left hand side that was um, strategically placed to block some of those detrimental paths that go straight down the hillside. So uh, if you're a big walker out in the park, you may have noticed that some of those trails we're trying to eliminate uh, and we'll be planting um, native plants there as well to further um, discourage foot traffic on there. And it's um, maybe not going to be quite as much fun to, to do, uh, you know, hide and seek in the forest without some of those trails. No doubt there will be some other ones that will, will be attempted to be made by folks, but um, hopefully we can message uh, down on the ground the importance of staying on the, the official trails for the uh, health of the forest. So. Um, so we worked really hard for that. Um, another thing that we did, and I mentioned, you know, uh, building steel towers as opposed to attaching to the trees for these suspended bridges that we're putting in there. Um, again, we concluded with the help of experts that in this particular case, uh, we don't want to further impact the root zone of these redwoods. And if you know, I'm sure everybody knows about redwoods, but you don't have deep tap roots with redwoods. You have, you know, shallow roots that are interlocked um, uh, with the grove, the members of the grove, and, uh, and you can really damage those. I mean, and so here, um, is Jim Spickler. He's one of our arborists. He's a, an expert on redwood ecology and he has discovered his favorite new, um, I don't want to call it a toy, it's a tool. And it's called an air spade and actually he and uh, Dr. Steve Spickler uh, Sillet at HSU are using this now to study the roots of redwoods. They, they were the ones that really pioneered the canopy uh, research uh, and now they're trying to figure out what's going on with the roots. Well, you don't want to study that and, and damage them at the same time. And so they're using what um, is called an air spade. That's what he's got in his hand there in, in the photo. And it just uh, shoots a, a really strong compressed air um, uh, spray that loosens the topsoil, uh, not a great deal. It's not like a giant cloud of dust, but it loosens it enough so that you can expose the roots. And then you just put it back on the roots and it's air is saw, it's the roots if they're compacted, which all the redwood roots around the zoo and the park are, um, it aerates those, which is um, kind of a, a desperately needed thing for the, the redwoods. Um, so what he's doing here, is he's, he's practicing working with the air spade and he's, and he's exposing the roots around this big old tree that was in the zoo paddock for years and years and years, trampled down by uh, bison and elk and other hoofstock, including our yak uh, in the recent past. Um, and he says that this technique is gonna really, the tree is really gonna be happy about this. Um, we'll be mulching over this. Um, after the construction is done. But um, that just shows us where the, the key roots are so that um, when we do, um, we, we, what we had to do for these towers to support the ascent ramp uh, uh, to get up to the launch deck and the suspended bridges, those are on the ground and they've got pilings going down into the ground uh, that you'll see a photo of. And we didn't want to just randomly, blindly drill down around these roots. So Jim exposed the, the, the essential roots that you would damage a tree if you cut. Uh, and so we modified where these platform structures went based on what he found with the air spade. So here's a little bit more work in the 
forest um, to identify, okay, we, we were, this is the site where we need to put another um, foundation. Uh, and so he air spaded around that whole site and found these roots. And so again, we were able, this is our architect Jason on the right hand side. Uh, he had to go back and, and redraw uh, a whole bunch of these um, just so that we could avoid a key route like you're seeing right there. Gretchen, real quick, um, is there going to be any more ivy removal? Yes, um, great question. Um, I forgot all about the native and invasive plant uh, part of this, but um, we actually got a grant from the state to do some invasive, invasive plant removal and native plant plantings. And part of that money went to the CCCs who um, last, well, this year um, did a lot of ivy removal. I'm sure most of you are aware of, of some of that elsewhere in the park. They, they really got a lot of pampas grass and ivy and holly out of there. Um, and then we'll be doing more of that um, as, we, as we wrap this project up, uh, as well as native plant planting. You don't want to really plant native plants until the rains have set in and really the best time to remove ivy is in the winter too so you don't rip out the the native deciduous stuff that's that's in amongst it. So um, so yeah I mean it's an ongoing that ivy is going to be decades <laughs> of removal as you can imagine but um, but we will be doing more of that associated with this project. And already you can see a difference um, with the ivy just not being um, on as many trees uh, growing up the sides and all that. So that's, that's really exciting. All right, were there any other questions right now? No, that was the only one. Okay, so these are some photos of the new road. And so another, another thing that I know everybody's familiar with is how uneven and broken asphalt and old the uh, the straight service road that runs right behind the zoo was um, and we even have board members who broke their um, bones <laughs> riding a, riding bikes uh, over those lumpy um, spots in the road it was just dreadful and it was never designed um, to go over redwood roots um, and that's always problematic you can see that all around Eureka where the sidewalk or the street is lifted because of redwood roots and so this project gave us an opportunity to connect and another part of the project that isn't the Skywalk, but is part of this big complex of grants that is helping fund it is to connect uh, that service road that now has a big curve in it um, to Glatt Street and to Madrone. And so that, that will make it a, an ADA accessible compliant uh, route of travel um, behind the zoo. And uh, it's a little more scenic now. It, it actually takes you uh, further into the into the trees. Um, and this shows part of that curve uh, that, and the fence isn't quite in yet, but that's all done. Um, it's still gravel right now um, at the very end of this project. Um, we unfortunately have to pave it. <laughs> Some of us would rather it stay gravel, but that's not gonna, um, it's actually going to be paved uh, with, I believe, asphalt, but I think it's going to be a porous asphalt. I'm not 100% sure. But um, And then this other photo here is the new fence, the new perimeter fence for the zoo that we put in along the road. And, and just an example of uh, the consciousness that um, the contractors uh, employ now to protect those roots. And so here's a, the fence kind of being modified around the roots. Uh, that exist. And, and there's a lot of roots out there. And you can imagine this just took an inordinate amount of planning, discovery, and then uh, redrawing and, and in the field rethinking of how we'd approach uh, a fence like this, because there's a big root, an important root there. So just a tremendous amount of care went into preserving the tree health um, as much as we could. So here's some construction shots. Uh, there's, there's work up in the trees. If you've gone out there lately, you've seen people in the trees all over this area. Um, that's Synergo is the company out of Portland that is creating the Skywalk itself. Um, they're experts. They've done projects like this all around the world. This is the first one in the Redwoods though, and it came with a whole set of unknowns and, uh, 
you know, uh oh's and oops, didn't anticipate that kind of uh, of issues that we've worked around. It's just taken a long time to to really figure out how to make it work with redwoods. Redwoods aren't as strong as a lot of the other trees that they've put um, canopy walks in, and so uh, there's there's ending up going to be more attachments to each tree than originally was planned. But again, the arboriculturists feel very confident that the trees uh, will be fine with those attachments. So up. Up in the air, the, the the platforms and the bridges are going in and down on the ground. This is the uh, kind of the framework and foundation for what's holding up these towers that take you up the ascent ramp to get to the launch deck and so forth. Lots of work. And the folks down on the ground that are doing this work um, are with con uh, Sequoia Construction, which is a local um, fantastic company that ha have just been wonderful to work with and they're the ones building these little towers that are actually sitting on the ground. Um, so here they, they finally decided that they'd go ahead and build some of these towers in their shop because they had more room than they did uh, on site. So they, they built this at their shop on the left and brought it in and, and got a crane to lift it up and put it on the foundation. And on the right hand side, you can see several of those towers that will hold the ascent ramp and the ascent ramp kind of winds its way from the, the hill inside the zoo next to the red pandas out into the forest and then eventually you'll pop over the perimeter fence and go out in further into the forest over the big ravines down there. Uh, and you'll eventually get to be about 100 feet in the air. This here, if you can see my cursor, is the launch deck. Um, it looks like it's going around a tree, but it's, that's not what it's doing. It's going to eventually have a roof on it. It's higher than this. Um, it, it's kind of hard to see the perspective, but you'll start here with the suspended bridge going out into the skywalk. Uh, and this, I think your foot will be at 34 feet, something like that in the air. And, and then you'll get higher, not going up physically, but the ground will fall out uh, below you. And that's how we'll get to that 100 foot um, in the air mark. Again, a few more perspectives. There's the launch deck on the left, uh, on the left-hand photo, and then the first uh, tree platform going out into the forest on the right. And this is another launch deck um, photo here. This is the gateway. Uh, and like I said, it's at the top of the tree. There's that beautiful old vine maple right behind this photo. Um, and again, this was a while back. There's, there's more, um, those, those kind of towers um, made of wood will be kind of sprinkled throughout this, what used to be our elk paddock. And then it goes out into the forest. And, and I'm abruptly jumping to another project. Um, and again, happy to answer questions about the Skywalk at any time. Um, and there's, there's a lot more information uh, on Facebook and, and our website about the project. Um, and then meanwhile, we were hoping that we could get started on our native predator zone. Uh, if you remember the master plan kind of has a lot of space in there for some really cool exhibits. And we recently partnered, you may have heard on the news, with the Bear River Rancheria um, to fund and partner with, uh, with the zoo and the city of Eureka and the Zoo Foundation to bring you the, the black bear and coyote exhibit. This is a mixed species exhibit um, is going to be large, um, certainly in the context of what our old black bear exhibit used to be, if you can remember that. Uh, and this will be in the forest. We're going to have um, a, a pool. This is a rendering of it before we even started the design. This is very conceptual. Um, we are now in the middle of the design for this. Um, I don't have any of those design uh, drawings to show you because it's still you know, subject to so much change that we, we don't want to quite get into that yet. But we should be done with the design of that by the opening of the Skywalk. And then we'll be able to pivot right into the construction of the Black Bear Coyote exhibit. Uh, and we hope that if, barring any other crazy things, um, we could, could have that open by, by next summer. 
and that's our goal. Um, you know, our goal again, wasn't quite met, um, with the skywalk. So you never know about that, but that's what we're going to shoot for. So this shows a beautiful, open, um, natural bear exhibit with several bears and you can see a coyote or two in there too. Um, we're going to do our very best to, um, to mix those species, but we're designing this so that if they decide they don't like to live together for whatever reason, um, we, we won't force them to do that and they'll be able to, to be kind of rotated back and forth between the two parts of the exhibit. Um, and then, so this is kind of on the ground as you're kind of walking through the middle of the zoo. This is a boardwalk that will take you on an eight foot elevated pass between the two habitats. Um, and then back up in here is the launch deck of the skywalk. So they're pretty closely um, adjacent to each other and you will be able to see down a little bit into the bear coyote exhibit from the skywalk experience. And again, we haven't started construction on that, but we sort of have because that's what the big new reroute of the, the, the trail behind the zoo and the new perimeter fence uh, gets us. Um, that's all bear habitat that you're looking at right there. Um, the picture at the top of the screen shows a lot of um, downed logs. Those are the, the white fur that we took out as, as wildlife habitat management. Those logs will be part of the bear exhibit and we're using those in design work right now um, to give the bears some uh, na natural structures to either climb on or shelter under. Um, and so they're staged right where we're going to need them because that's where the bears are going to be. Um, and they'll have not quite an acre of, of habitat there. Okay, so let's see, what's my time looking like? Okay, um, just got a little bit of pivot to do here, as you can see. Um, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about how the pandemic has affected the zoo. Um, so there's our, our favorite mascot, Super Salmon, and she's imploring everyone to wear a mask. Um, and uh, we got her to wear a mask, but she didn't like it much because the person inside that mascot has to see through the mouth. And so <laughs> that was a, oh, one of those head slap moments that we're not gonna be able to have our mascot walking around with a mask on because the person running her inside can't see. <laughs> But one of those, who would have ever thought of that um, kind of snafus? But anyhow, she's still our mascot and, and, and uh, everybody loves her and hopefully uh, is modeling some good behavior. Um, we closed uh, March 17th um, and, uh, and didn't reopen until uh, a few days before the 4th of July, um, waiting for, you know, permission from the county and the state and uh, had to go through the opening plan with the county. And um, that gave us an opportunity to kind of see how other zoos around the country were doing this. And it's, it was not easy to figure out how to get people to have a, a safe and fun experience at the zoo. And sadly, you know, there's a lot of things that you can't do at the zoo right now. Um, we're looking forward to the day where we can reopen some of these things. But um, for now, uh, we require reservations uh, if you want to come to the zoo. And that's so that we can limit the number of people in the zoo so that we can maintain some semblance of social distancing. Um, so we tried to, to create a whole formula of, of how much square footage we have and what that six foot distancing looks like and, and uh, what our pinch points were and how we could do one way traffic flow and how we would you know, cue people up to the ticket booth and how we would uh, staff it so that we could disinfect two or three times a day and uh, on and on and on. And so it, um, uh, it's, it's working. Uh, we, we have, and the photos that you're about to see don't show almost anybody at the zoo. We, we've had great visitation, um, a lot less than normal, as you can imagine, because we have to do it that way. Um, but, but these pictures, we just happened to take them when <laughs> there wasn't anyone uh, enjoying the zoo at the moment. But so we had, uh, we're, we're typically full up with our reservations. That's now dropping off a little bit because school's coming back in line. But, um, um, 
what else to say? You know, um, the, the other thing about reservations is it allows for contact tracing if um, in the bad, uh, unfortunate scenario that uh, they trace the zoo as, as a point of infection, we can, we know who's come. So that's, that's helpful. Um, so just a few things that you encounter as you, as you come into the zoo. Um, we've got these fun little paw prints and some, you know, fun plays on words of how to, how to distance. Uh, two spider monkeys apart is one of the graphics and, and that kind of thing. So we've tried to have as much fun with it as we could, but um, Alas, you know, our water play area, we, we don't have open the otter tube, you can't go through that. Um, no, no petting zoo contact at this point. Um, a, a, a few things you can do interactively if we can ensure that we can disinfect those surfaces. So, um, so I'm hoping that as we get more information about COVID, we will be able to um, strategically relax some of these things if it's safe to do so and we get approval. So um, stay tuned on that. Um, just a few other things. We've got a lot of hand sanitizer stations throughout the zoo. We try to prop open doors so that you don't have to grab handles as much as, as you did. Uh, and then um, one thing to note about the zoo that's, that's unique um, with, with any other amenity and you know uh, I personally just am aghast at the impact that is had on my favorite you know restaurants and and uh, facilities in, in Humboldt that just makes this place such a great place to live. Um, at the zoo we actually have a, an additional challenge not only are we massively impacted budget-wise, as is everybody, but um, we actually have animals at the zoo that can contract this, um, this SARS uh, uh, virus. And um, those include the primates, as you can imagine. So we erected another barrier that just gives a little bit more distance between people and our spider monkeys. Uh, the tamarins are pretty safe the way their situation is already set up, but the otters are apparently susceptible as well. And so we've had to kind of um, modify those view stations in various places. So um, so zoos, zoos and aquariums, they, they're in trouble, uh, as you can imagine, all over the country because we can't, um, we can't eliminate a lot of staff. We did lay off um, or um, furlough, actually, um, a lot of our support staff that are here for people, um, but half of our staff or more are, um, are there to take care of the animals and we're not furloughing the animals. And so it still is uh, very expensive to run a zoo or an aquarium. And the bigger you are, you know, the more impacted they have been in this pandemic uh, because they rely so heavily on revenue uh, for gate admission and things like that. So um, we are the same. The city of Eureka is in dire straits with the budget and we've had to make the biggest budget cuts of my career here um, and we're still struggling so um, so it's been it's been tough uh, meanwhile though we did decide to, to, to have summer camps they were very successful they were completely full but they were at half capacity so that we could maintain those kind of pods of, of kids um, they had masks on they had a blast um, and they didn't really seem to mind the masks uh, at all, um, but, uh, but half capacity for summer camps. Um, and then uh, not to do at all with, with the pandemic, um, we have been also working on modifications and remodels to our entry pavilion. Uh, these are two old shots um, of a very crowded, cramped uh, indoor cafe seating and then that gift shop just tightly packed into a very small space behind. Um, and then our, our old ticket booth here. Um, over the winter, we were able to, we eliminated the Secrets of the Forest exhibitry on the other side of the entry pavilion and created a new gift shop there. We've got about three times the space. Uh, it's actually compliant uh, with various codes now. And um, a much more 
pleasant shopping experience. It hasn't been open a lot um, because of uh, COVID, but um, it's it's open most most days and hours that the zoo is open, uh, and and it's it's great and it's a revenue generator for the zoo. Um, meanwhile, the cafe is now expanded all the way into that space, the indoor cafe seating, and another major change with our operation is that um, it's it's under new management and we've leased the operation of the cafe food service to um, uh, Christine Silver, uh, who is the owner of uh, Delish on Fifth and Humboldt Soup Company and um, what's the other one, uh, the eatery at Sixth and E. And um, she is, she's very successful. She's even been successful during the pandemic. And, um, and this was in the works before all that hit. And then it really just got, um, uh, impacted greatly by that. It doesn't look anything like this and I wasn't able to get in there to take um, new photos because I, I'm in isolation because I, I traveled out of the county within the last two weeks. So um, what she did in here is just amazing. You've got to come in if for no other reason than to see the inside of the cafe. We can't serve people inside right now, um, but uh, She's got beautiful murals that um, um, Blake Reagan did. He's the uh, Eureka Artist of the Year of 2019. He came in and on that wall where Bill's art is hanging at the back of that picture is the most beautiful mural of Bill uh, contemplating a river with Mount Shasta in the background. I wish I had a photo to show you, but... Um, but you'll have to come in and see it. And then on the wall opposite is, this is only partially done, but a beautiful tree with red pandas in it and all kinds of native animals peppered around. Chester the cat made it in there and that's just the neatest thing. Um, she's rebranded the cafe. It's called Ecos Cafe now. And again, I, I haven't been able to go in and eat lunch. She just opened about a week and a half ago and rave, rave reviews of, of that kind of food. It's it's pretty traditional uh, menu, but she's starting out slow and then, um, you know, as success happens for her, she'll expand that menu. But I hear it's fantastic. Um, and just to wrap up a little, a few more things going on at the zoo, um, you know, I, I always want to mention our native plant initiative and we're, we're really rocking that. Um, we've been doing that now for about three years. Um, the hedgerow in front of the zoo it used to be that big Escalonia hedge has now gotten, um, not at overgrown, but it now requires a little bit of trimming, but it's looking great. Um, especially right now, it's just a, uh, a wildlife diverse uh, native hedgerow that that offers a lot all times of the year uh, and so inside the zoo we're kind of slowly transforming these landscapes and this is the latest one um, that our native uh, plant experts Monty Cade and his crew of folks um, that, that this was another giant towering overgrown Escalonia clump um, and he and another guy uh, took that out, dug out the stumps, which is no small feat, and then planted this in native plants, and it's just going to be beautiful. Um, and native plants, if you don't know, are critically important to all manners of native wildlife um, because they support the, uh, the insects that support the, the entire food web. So, um, we love native plants at the zoo. Uh, other conservation going on, I've, I've mentioned the condor program. That is really looking like it's getting uh, closer to reality. Um, and it might actually, we might actually have condors in the sky in 2021. We're still working on some budget uh, and logistic issues to get our care facility built. Um, and hopefully we'll have that built by the time uh, we need to receive condors. And this is not an exhibit. This is just a, a care facility for condors who've had lead poisoning. Um, uh, and, you know, it's a reality that condors get themselves into trouble with, with the pollution that we've, we've put in the environment. So we're hoping to kind of stave off some of that um, 
that problem with with some support at the zoo. And then this other photo shows Christine Damiani, who's our butterfly technician. She's in her third year now of uh, rearing uh, threatened and endangered butterflies or uh, in the area. And we got another seventy seven thousand dollar grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, service to continue that work this year. So she is a, a one woman um, uh, showstopper. She's just uh, such a hard worker, developed this whole protocol for getting these butterflies to survive the winter. And then uh, she released several dozen out uh, on Horse Mountain this year. Um, so pretty, pretty exciting work there. Um, and then we, we, we haven't got a lot of things that are new at the zoo, um, but we had a couple of crested screamer chicks hatch. And so they're, they're adorable, but not for long because they become teenagers pretty quickly. Um, the flamingos are nesting again. I think there's probably about 15 eggs now that have been laid. So we might have another banner crop of flamingo chicks. That would be really exciting. Uh, but the thing I'm most excited about is this beautiful, adorable photo of a lamprey right here on your screen. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's not meant to replace the cuteness of the red pandas, but boy, I think they're close, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So lampreys are what the eel river was named after. They're not technically an eel, but they're a long fish that looks like an eel and they have a sucker and they, they prey on salmon and other fish in the ocean. And then they come up into our rivers to spawn. And uh, they're a, a very important food source for all kinds of wildlife and um, people. And native tribes locally um, subsisted on lamprey a lot. Um, and, uh, and they're just a, a fascinating story. So they're in there. We've got about nine of them, I think, in one of our uh, former salmon tanks. And a whole host of native uh, river fish, like sculpin and stickleback and, and things like that in that exhibit. So come see the lampreys. You, you won't be disappointed unless they're not sticking on the, the window and then you don't get to see this beautiful mouth. <laughs> but, um, they're cool. They're really cool. We're going to have a lecture on them during our virtual conservation lecture series this fall. So please tune into that. And um, I think with that, I'm just going to to take any questions that you have because it's almost oh. Great, Gretchen. We do have um, several questions. So I'll try and put them in an order that will make sense. Okay. Um, one question is, what is going to happen with the Dahlia Garden? The Dahlia Garden. Um, what, what's happening with it? Is that what the question was? Yeah, the question is just what is going to happen. But yeah, what's is there going anything to happen? happen with it? Yeah. Uh, nothing's going to happen with the Dahlia Garden. Um, it used to be, uh, when we did our master plan in 2006, we identified only two places where the zoo could do any expansion whatsoever because it's landlocked. One of them was out into the forest, which we just did, and the other one was just grabbing that little bit of Dahlia Garden piece, and we were going to put the prairie dog exhibit there, um, but we, we had a, just a few people, uh, you know, express um, consternation about that. And um, we needed to, it's complicated, but we needed to do a CEQA review for the new master plan. And we also knew that we had a chance of funding the Redwood Skywalk um, pretty quickly. And we didn't want to, um, we didn't want to delay the likelihood of that project getting underway by having to um, to to wrestle about the dahlia garden. So we just took that out of the master plan. Um, so no more prairie dogs. Uh, I, I get a lot more questions about when are the prairie dogs coming back than than we do about the the dahlia garden. But we know that the dahlia garden is a, a is a beloved you know amenity and just as historic as the zoo. So it's staying there. And you know, unfortunately, again with budget cuts, there's not a lot of uh, funding to to do much more with it. It needs work for sure, but um, you know, maybe we'll find some funders for that one day. But, uh, but it's, it's blooming like crazy right now and, and it will continue to do so. And then um, there was a question about the, the fir trees. Um, Donna was saying she thought that there were, um, I, wanna, I hope I say this right, obese grandis or grand fur or another common name is western white fur which is different from a white fur. 
Oh, okay. Well, I should have said Western white fur. Grand fur is what I used to call them. And then the project folks are always referring to them as white fur. So I sort of changed my, my description of them. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of different names for those. They're the ones with the, the kind of whitish pink bark. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's the correct um, terminology. It's the, those were grand fur that we took out. There were a couple of redwoods, one of which, and I meant to put this in the, the presentation and I forgot, but there was a big old uh, kind of impaired redwood right at Glatt Street uh, that's gone. You can see the stump there. They had to take that out to connect Glatt Street with this new trail. And it was also uh, not ADA compliant. It was pushing up all kinds of um, sidewalk issues and uh, had been kind of hammered with trimming. Um, and so that was the, the, the main redwood that had to be eliminated from the, from the forest for the project. And we're using those redwood pieces um, to, to do some really cool things associated with the bear exhibit that we'll be talking about soon. Great. And then, um, is it possible, can you go back to like one of the earlier slides where you showed the whole skywalk? Um, the question is like, where in the zoo, where does the skywalk go over the zoo? So I think maybe having yeah. that. Idea. Yeah, I should have gotten a better rendering for you because this isn't a very good one. So apologies on that. I, you know what, I think there's something on the on the website, website. But anyway let's let's just make this work um because it, it does show it all it's just kind of and you know what i think i can i can wait i can't i'm sorry i can hold on oh my gosh where'd it go here there can i make it bigger yes i can now can you guys see that bigger that's much bigger on my screen okay. Cool. Oh, and, and I didn't talk about the interpretive center, so I can do that too. So um, here's the Watershed Heroes. This is the otter exhibit and you walk along and, uh, and this is all construction now. Um, this is where the bear exhibit's going to begin, more or less. Um, and you're one day going to hopefully encounter a, a fantastic, the coolest Redwood Interpretive Center uh, ever conceived. It should be going right there. It's going to um, require a lot of fundraising and, and design work, but we're, we're starting that already. Um, so you continue that curve, the caveys are right down here, the Patagonian caveys, and then you climb this hill which is where the um, vine maple is in the middle of that planter. And you, you take a right and you'll be going out onto this ascent ramp is what we call it. It'll be flat right here. And then it will go at a, at a gradual, less than 5% grade, wending its way around all these trees um, all the way. And here, the blue line is where the, the edge of the zoo is. The new perimeter fence starts right here. So you're going to not quite pop out right there. That's not exactly accurate. And you'll keep going until you hit the launch deck, which is very close to the edge of the zoo perimeter fence, the, the new one. Behind you will be the bear exhibit, bear coyote. And then you'll, um, you'll either be able to go this way. Uh, let's see, are we doing... Now I'm forgetting. It was that it was all going to be 100% um, ADA accessible and we had to do some, uh, some reevaluation due to our budget. So this is going to be more of an adventure leg out to here. So that will not be ADA accessible. This will be fully ADA accessible. So no elevation changes along here. Well, there will be no you won't be noticing the elevation change as you walk along it um, but the ground drops out there and then it gets you to this big redwood here and these are big tree platforms that will be able to have events on um, classes can be up there and small ones it'll 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 hold you know 25 people um, 
uh, fairly easily on these. These are just, these are smaller tree platforms that you'll just be able to kind of ooch around uh, as people go by you. And then there will be a, another adventure leg out to this big old spruce tree. And this is the, the stream and the, the trail at the very bottom of Sequoia Park that goes down to the duck pond down here, it's, which is off the map. You're not going to be able to probably see the duck pond very well from here, but maybe a little. Um, and so here's the old road. All of this is going to be redone, by the way. It's still that old um, asphalt surface that's broken up, but this will be repaved and elevated so that it won't be impacted by the roots and vice versa. So the tree health, again, will be much improved and it goes all the way around and then on to Glatt Street there. So hopefully that answers that question a little bit better. It looks like there's a little bit more like over the bear exhibit towards, is that some of the skywalk too? Like uh, this? Yeah, yeah. That is the boardwalk that's going to transect the, uh, the, the two sides of the Bear Coyote exhibit. Okay. And you'll start that back here somewhere, and then it gains an elevation up to about, um, to about eight feet. Uh, so that just gets you kind of through the Bear Coyote exhibit. They'll be able to pass under it. Uh, and, and this is still a concept. Um, we are now designing this whole space and so it'll look a little bit different than what we're showing right now, which is why we have to update the master plan uh, each project because, you know, concept and, and actual design are two very different things, especially when you're trying to, to design something in the middle of a redwood grove. Um, it's like, oh, this is the perfect place for a bear night quarter, but, um, but there's a giant redwood in the, in the way and we're not going to eliminate redwoods for this project. So anyway. Um, there's a, one comment that says that they, um, I miss the prairie dogs, which I do too. <laughs> we all love the prairie dogs, right? And then um, when do you expect to have the gibbons and lemurs? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, the Skywalk is underway, the Bear Coyote exhibit uh, is next, and then probably the very next thing that we want to fundraise for is this interpretive center. There will be some small animal exhibits in here, but it's mostly to anchor the, well, what's the big deal about the Redwood Sky Trail? Why are Redwoods important? What we can't do on this experience is flood it full of signage because um, you're just gonna, what's the point of being up, you know, halfway up into the tree canopy if you're just looking at signs. So we didn't want to make it an experience like that. So we need a, a building down here that will really um, tell the full story of the redwoods, why they're important, what they've done for humans uh, in the history of, of the world and, and how we can uh, preserve what we've got left and, and continue to use redwood. Um, and so that's probably going to be our next project. Um, meanwhile, this whole area is a coyote, or a, yeah, sorry, a cougar exhibit, mountain lion. Um, and then we've got some other smaller native predators to put in there. Uh, and then <laughs> it'll probably be time to start working on the north side of the zoo. So it's several years down the, the road. Um, and you know, funding is is even more challenging now. These exhibits are incredibly expensive. Um, but meanwhile, the the great thing about the gibbons, I mean, it's it's unbelievable that we don't have gibbons. This is probably the first time in 40 years that we haven't had gibbons at the zoo or longer. Um, and every day, you know, they would serenade us with their duetting, and it was just fantastic. And then we lost Jolene uh, last summer was it gosh I'm losing track of time and uh and but the the great thing about that was that bono now is living in the coolest gibbon habitat i've ever seen in a zoo it's in santa barbara he and his new mate are just thrilled with each other you never know how that's gonna go and she was just she's older than him and she was doing backflips and the keepers had never seen her do that behavior <laughs> so literally literally uh backflips um, when they got together. So anyway, he's doing great down there, a beautiful natural island uh, habitat. And so we hope to duplicate something like that here, but it's, it's gonna be down the road, unfortunately. Oh, that's a great story. Um, how will financial issues affect entry fees? Um, how will uh, 
how will, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How will financial issues affect entry fees? Entry fees, um, well, one of the reasons that um, we decided to do the Skywalk now was so that we could become more financially sustainable. Um, and uh, so we will be, we'll, it will affect our, uh, our admission. We don't know yet how much um, until some things get, you know, kind of figured out. The zoo experience itself is, is less than it was because of the pandemic issues. So um, we probably the, the modeling that we'd done in our feasibility plan uh, will have to be modified. Uh, but when the Skywalk is open to the public, um, we will be increasing uh, the daily admission as well as me membership. We just, I can't tell you what that's going to look like yet. Uh, and, and hopefully there will be a little bit of a grace period um, before we do those increases. We don't even know when we're going to um, to open it because of COVID and the restrictions. Of, and, you know, these are narrow walkways. They're about five feet across. And so how how to do that with social distancing, we, we, we don't quite know yet. So. Um, right, right. And then um, are you allowing volunteers to participate in maintenance? into keeping? I know that you have in the past, but are they, are you working with volunteers right now? Uh, right now, that's a great question. We are um, opening it back up to landscape volunteers and project volunteers um, because they can be outside and they're not working super closely with our keeper staff. Um, the animal care volunteers <clears throat> are still on a hi hiatus until uh, until something shakes loose with the with the virus because of the close proximity and indoors that you've got to work with the uh, with the zoo staff so um, our our number one priority is is keeping our animal collection safe but especially our animal care staff because if if they get sick um, you know we just have such a small trained staff that um, we, we we've got to make sure that they're as safe as they possibly can be so yeah. stay tuned on that and then um, another question was, can you have, are, and I, I, can't, I think you kind of talked about this the last time you presented, um, having, is, it, is the Skywalk going to be the same ticket as getting into the zoo or is it going to be an extra ticket? Great question. Um, we were informed by the feasibility consultants that um, the, the best plan would be to make it one inclusive ticket. Uh, and just make that Redwood Skywalk experience part of the zoo experience. Um, it's it's less to manage. Uh, it's not as costly to do it that way. And and it's just more of a, a passive, yep, yeah, you're in the zoo now, you can do whatever you want kind of thing instead of a, oh, now you've got to, you know, get a different ticket. So yeah, it'll be the same ticket. An e-ticket <laughs> back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and another question was, um, have you considered adding murals to the exterior of zoo fencing? We have considered that. There's some pretty cool um, fencing that you can get for that. Um, a lot of the fencing is is covered or will be covered by by vegetation, but um, but it's got to be really good artwork, and that's not uh, a, an inexpensive thing to have. So. Um, what we were really hoping we would have by now was a beautiful zoo themed mural on W Street in Harris. There's an intersection there where there's a, a private residence that has a, a, a concrete wall that gets tagged a lot. And um, so the artist that did the um, utility box at the corner of S and Harris, um, we asked her to, to draw up a concept for that whole wall. It's really long and it would sort of be this, you know, um, wayfinding way to the zoo uh, when you're driving down Harris Street and we just we just don't have the, the money to do that unfortunately yet so um, so good murals good artwork is is worth the money for sure it's just finding the money is the challenge so, yeah. I'm curious as to whether you've looked at the murals that have been done on the ballpark in Arcata and I have no idea whether they've been freebies or financed or. Oh or, yeah, I just saw those. Those are kind of cool, mm -hmm. and and I think it 
there are ways of doing it without it costing a bundle. Yeah. Um, artists are pretty ingenious. They, they draft, they, they did their murals on plywood, which can be attached to the uh, metal fencing mm -hmm. and obviously removed. Um, so I have no idea who funded that or who did it. Um, I saw an article in the paper, which looked really cool. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something you could do or consider. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you could do something like the uh, Otter Project did to get sponsors mm -hmm. um, for the otters. Um, anyway, that's, and, and maybe you could align with that project as part of uh, what you're doing, because I think that's been relatively successful. So those are just a couple of ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate those. <clears throat> um... Yep, there's there's always um, a lot more that we can and want to do. Um, uh, sometimes it comes down to to, to staffing and and uh, just the 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 bodies to to get stuff like that coordinated. The the Otter Project is a great example. That was that was one professor with a small team of folks to help him, no doubt. But um, we we were partnering with with that project too and had our otter all picked out and then of course that got delayed so um we will be we will be doing we will be participating in, in that fun project once once things open up a little bit more if they do um and that might be a good time to then segue into talking to artists about about the fence we've got a lot of fence so it'd be nice to pretty it up for sure how does the zoo foundation uh work with getting volunteer help raising money for things like this um you know there's there's two bon there's two staff people with the foundation right now lee otker is the executive director and ashley mobley is the uh marketing and events uh director and uh and they um they work with the volunteer board of directors um and zoo staff to to figure out priorities and then and then do the work to, to you know, either find grants um, or other partners. Um, they helped us uh, create the partnership with the tribe to, uh, to find the funding for the, the animal exhibit. Um, so, and she's actually um, right now soliciting funds for that mural project that I was talking about on W and Harris Street. Um, but again, it's just, uh, you know, we're limited by what all can happen amongst all of our other duties. And so volunteering to, to do some grant writing and some, some uh, networking in the community would be welcome. And, uh, and you could talk to me or Lee Otker at the Zoo Foundation at any time. Um, they're, they're still, I believe, looking for board members uh, on the board as well. So that's another opportunity. That's great. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Well, Alex was asking how much how much would it cost to get some of that um, that artwork done? And, and um, that mural, uh, let's see if I can recall right, was something like it's a big it's a big wall and it wraps around the corner um so i believe and it was it was a beautiful design that had a lot of detail in it and i believe that was going to be around seven thousand dollars six to seven thousand and you know that doesn't sound like a lot and it's absolutely well worth it and it will save it will beautify the the corner and save you know tagging you know behavior probably uh, and we don't we don't have that we don't have anything like that kind of um, money to, to spare for that so you know it's it's a matter of where where you you know focus your priorities uh, but she's ready to roll on that project as soon as we find funding so we've been talking to some rotary clubs and the city of Eureka they thought they had some money but they don't now so um, well hopefully you'll find that money because that would be awesome it would. Um, we will. I don't even want to ask this question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Gretchen, are you still planning to retire early? <laughs> well, <laughs> I wondered if that would come up. Um, I already have, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, and that was, you know, that was a decision that um, 
wasn't made lightly, that's for sure. And it was unexpected, but it was a budget driven issue. Um, so I am now semi-retired, um, working only half time and, uh, going to be working on other projects now that aren't associated with the zoo. But, um, but for the next year or two, I will still be, um, working on a part-time basis with the city for the zoo. Who does the majority of your grant writing? Uh, myself and Lee uh, do do that. Uh, there's also some staff support with our community services department with the city of Eureka that Donna Wood heads up now. And I'll tell you, Donna Wood, she's the new interim uh, director for the community services department. Uh, Miles uh, is now the interim city manager. Both of those uh, folks have been really good at finding and winning grants. Zoo staff have as well, but I think together that is a, a pretty powerhouse team um, to find the, the higher level um, state grants, state and federal grants. So we're, we've got a few in the queue that we're lo looking at really closely. The smaller grants tend to um, we just, we have to go, okay, do we have time to do this or, or prioritize that? So smaller grants are, are the ones that, um, that sometimes don't get the attention and can really make a big difference. Um, so those are, those are the ones that we can really use some help on, I think. Great. Well, Gretchen, you have been wonderful. You've done a fabulous job. You've had a great you and the people that you work with have had a great vision for the zoo and it's very exciting and we're really looking forward to seeing it materialize in reality and yeah. everybody who wants to clap knows the time <laughs> because we appreciate everything you've done and look forward to your future here well okay. i as well. Hurrah, i can see everybody <laughs> <laughs>